Hey, everyone. <laughs> that was a fun <laughs> effect. <Hey. laughs> yeah, so uh, a little background to the people watching. Uh, so today, uh, I'm fortunate to be joined by uh, a number of uh, esteemed uh, security professionals and DevSecOps experts. Uh, some of them uh, were doing it before it was cool or before it was even uh, had a name. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so basically uh, what we're going to be doing is, um, first we have a couple of prompts that we're going to start off with, but we were hoping to spend most of the time uh, answering questions from you all uh, for whatever is most uh, immediately useful and relevant. So um, yeah, so please uh, chime in uh, on the chat. And we got a couple of questions from Twitter. Uh, feel free to do that as well. Um, but yeah, let's uh, just go around and uh, introduce ourselves. Um, yeah, Tanya, you are most uh, directly next to me. So uh, do you want to uh, go first? Yeah, I'd love to. Hi, I'm Tanya Jenka. I am also known as She Hacks Purple, and I run a security training company called SheHacksPurple.dev, and I am a giant nerd at large on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's pretty accurate. <laughs> yeah, it's truth. Uh, yeah, Doug, uh, would you like to go next? Oh man, I gotta follow Tanya. Uh, um, my name is Doug DeBerry. I'm currently the director of defense at Datadog. Um, been with Datadog about three and a half, uh, going on four years now. Uh, was head of ProdSec there and various other wore various other hats. Uh, my background is mostly in uh, security consulting, penetration testing, that sort of stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, happy to be here. Cool. And uh, Zane. Sure. Hey. Hi everyone, I'm Zane Lackey. I'm the uh, the co-founder and the CISO of Signal Sciences. Uh, and prior to that, I was the uh, the CISO at Etsy and built and ran the security program there. Cool, thanks. And uh, Justine? Hi everyone, I'm Justine. I am currently a manager of an offensive security team at Apple. And my background is mostly in breaking things uh, as a security consultant uh, for most of my career and also have uh, spend some time doing AppSec and uh, working a bit on the building side of things as well. Very cool. And yeah, uh, hey, my name's Clint. Uh, I'm currently the head of security research at a company called R2C. We're building sort of a lightweight static analysis tool that hopefully you won't hate, unlike uh, many other tools. Um, we've had previous panels uh, and people talk negatively <laughs> about them. I don't know, inside joke. Um, we just started, Clint. Give it a minute. Give it a minute. <laughs> we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to that, I promise. <laughs> um, yeah, but before this, I was a uh, research director and technical director at NCC Group doing uh, pen testing of all the things, but also helping companies uh, scale security uh, and DevSecOps security automation, things like that. Uh, I also have a newsletter, uh, tldrsec.com, where I uh, read a bunch of things and condense the best stuff down in one place. Um, but yeah, so let's uh, get started. Um, so one thing that I think uh, many people have uh, challenges with is uh, you know, in every organization, there's many things you could do, right? There's uh, tens of things that seem like a reasonable use of time. And so I was curious um, for you all when you were uh, orienting in an organization, like um, what's your sort of thought process or methodology for determining, you know, of the 50 things we could do, what are maybe like the top few that make sense to do first? And, and also what's your criteria for selecting uh, if you want to do that? Or maybe it's like almost always we should do this. Um, yeah, pretty open-ended. I don't know how we're supposed to decide who starts because usually on a panel, there's like, <laughs> you're so like honest. you just kind of like shake, you're like, I have the mic, it's my turn. <laughs> yeah, how about uh, Tanya, you start. I'll, I'll try to hand off. <laughs> like, I guess use your eyes to be like, I have something to say. And uh, I'll, do, I'll do this. Will yeah. <laughs> if you can smize, uh, then I'll, I'll pass it to you. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so I usually start with, um, I, I look at if they have policies and standards, because if they don't have any guidance whatsoever for developers, then that's probably a problem. And then I also try to get a copy of all of the previous tests that they've done forever, how long with however many tools. And then I crunch all the data because I enjoy that. <laughs> um, and then I make like a top three of bad stuff. And then we try to knock that bad stuff out and start measuring metrics in a better, more effective way, see what's working. So it's like, let's show my value immediately by trying to knock down these three things. Uh, and two of the three things are always, 
lots of cross-site scripting and everyone is allergic to security headers. So you could even probably just start with that almost anywhere um, and, and work from there. But yeah, like I wanna get metrics. I wanna have some sort of policy of some sort and then just top three. Nice, I like it a lot. Um, yeah, Doug, what about you? I have something to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so I, I like to, or, you know, I always kind of recommend like just hearts and minds talking with people, raising awareness in a, you know, as, as general a way as possible. Right. So talk to, you know, talk to, uh, high level folks, VPs, directors, team leads, as well as low level folks, you know, ICs, interns, you know, whatever the case may be, just try to get a good, uh, cross section of, of the company or engineering as much as you can try to understand the culture. Um, as much as you can. And then, you know, I kind of do, uh, you know, try to f find where, you know, what skeletons are in what closets and try to just prioritize based on what's what I think is going to get us first, right? Like based on what those gaps are. And then and then go for it, depending on, you know, the, depending on the culture, depending on uh, the needs and the resources you have available, like all those things play in uh in, in a very strange dynamic no matter where you are um so i think it's it's you really have to kind of do your homework first and and figure out what you're looking at and then ruthlessly prioritize and just keep chipping away at that list yeah do you have any yeah. tips on uncovering uh skeletons and closets i'm curious um yeah, uh, honestly, I think it's talking to people. Um, that's one of the the big, like, you know, just that's the simple question of like, what's, you know, what keeps you up at night or what scares you the most, right? And if they've never, you know, if it's a newer company or a smaller company, they've never really like spoken too much to security folks. Uh, a lot of people have a lot of thoughts, you know, it's, it's surprisingly so. So uh, um, I find that to be very effective, just doing interviews essentially when you first get there. Nice, yes, definitely. Uh, yeah, I would second what. Oh, sorry, Justine. Go ahead, Zane. No, Justine. No, no, go for it. We can all we can all do the eyes. <laughs> <laughs> I was just gonna say, yeah, I I would I totally agree with both Tanya and Doug. I think those things are really really important, and I think one of the things I like to start with is what is the sort of high level threat model? What are the things that we actually care about? What would make us have a really bad day? and then kind of drill down from there and say, okay, well, we care about these things. So let's go drill into what are the fundamentals around those things and what are the things that we could do to harden that up. And um, I think prioritization is one of the hardest things and figuring out as soon as possible, what is risky, what you think is high risk, what you think is lower risk, what you care about is really important to, to get started. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I can round it out here of just kind of building off of what everybody said. I think, you know, regardless of whether you're coming into a big established security program already, or whether you're the first security hire, or whether you're a consultant being asked to give your opinion on a security program, I think a lot of the first steps that uh, folks have really found to be successful, and I know I have in my past, is you know talking with the rest of leadership, whether that's technical leadership or business leadership, and saying like, look, I'm sure you have had negative experiences with security in the past. Uh, this is the style of security program that we want to build here, or like what will make security effective here is if security is here to help enable the business actually deliver on what it wants to deliver on. So, you know, that is kind of the, the top level goal of security uh, and really having that communication from the beginning. So then you can go have all of these great different pieces that Justine and Tanya and Doug mentioned of, you know, where are the skeletons in the closet? What are you, what is your organizational threat model that's keeping you up at night? What are you thinking about from a app or API wide perspective? But starting from that real place of saying, look, if security is going to be successful, it's got to enable everybody to, to move at the speed that they want to move at. Otherwise it just gets routed around. Yeah, totally. I, I like that a lot. And I hear that again and again from many people at different uh, companies who have sort of forward thinking security programs where I think there's been this strategic shift from uh, security being the, the gatekeepers and the naysayers to being like, okay, how do we empower people? How do we enable the business? Uh, and I've heard this theme from a bunch of other uh, talks today. So it, it's nice to uh, see sort of as an industry, we're like, oh, we should maybe be more likable. Uh, <laughs> Make sure you don't say no all the time. People will actually ask you on how to improve stuff. It's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> it's crazy. 
It's yeah. almost like human psychology uh, matters. <laughs> um, <laughs> so actually, uh, one thing that uh, Tanya said before that I thought would be interesting to come back to is um, this idea of like eliminating uh, classes of vulnerabilities. So I think uh, it's easy to sort of get into this, um, you know, whack-a-mole state where um, you're just like, find a bug, fix it, find a bug, fix it, but that's not really scalable. There's many more people writing code and, uh, you know, a small team trying to defend it. So uh, I'm curious if any of you could share an example of like a, a vulnerability class uh, that you eliminated at a company or sort of how you were able to sort of like systematically raise the security bar, uh, either by eliminating a vulnerability class or just something that's better than sort of a point in time fix. Um, yeah, I think I saw some slightly widened eyes from <laughs> Anya. <laughs> I wanted to give other people a chance, but then I also wanted to make fun of myself, so it was like a hard call there. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> so, so I've worked at two places where we chose a specific vulnerability class. Um, one was cross-site scripting and one was like injection as a whole. And I know that like cross-site scripting serve like it's type of injection, but I feel it's special because it's in the browser and just so popular. It's just a popular thing for us to code. Um, and so one of the things we did was we created like a deep dive video, like a lunch and learn, you know, back when you could be in the same room as another human. And, you know, I taught all the devs, but then we recorded it and it was about like what the actual risk is. So it turned out a lot of the devs thought cross-site scripting is actually just pop-up boxes and it just makes your app look silly. And so when I explained the actual things you could do with cross-site scripting and also stuff I had done to their apps with it, um, they're like, oh, that seems really bad. Um, and then I explained how to find it and how they could totally find it and bust it. Um, and then explained like, now let's make unit tests so that never comes back and like, we made kind of a game out of it and like, oh, I crushed this and high fives and other things and then started testing for it, right? <laughs> and started reinforcing that and like, if you did find it, we're gonna make a unit test to make sure it doesn't accidentally tumble back in. Um, and I found like supporting them with code samples, supporting them with like, OWASP creates this cross-site scripting filter evasion sheet sheet. So I gave that to them and showed them how to go test for it and what to look for in the code. And so then they're like, we got this, Tanya, what's next? Right? And kind of enabled them, if that makes sense. I also gave them scanners, like Zap. And Zap's not perfect, right? Like if you have someone, like a developer that's not super uh, security, they haven't done a lot of security testing, that's not their job, but they could still find lots of stuff with it. And I found they did pick up a bit of it. And then that meant it was work I didn't have to do. And I like that. <laughs> <laughs> so those are some of the things I've done, but I would love to hear what everyone else has done because I'm secretly writing down all your notes so I can look smarter. <laughs> uh, I can I can toss one out there on just the um, less of the how and more of kind of what this actually gives you, which is when you start to think about eliminating vuln classes, the, the way that, um, that I've always done this at scale and that I've seen this done at scale is really you focus on for whatever some of the common frameworks that your engineering teams are using, whatever, you find the, the safe ways to do that and you make that the default inside the framework so that then what you what you find is, okay, if we make this the default, it doesn't mean people will never opt out of the default, but it means now when we're gonna go do code review or deep dive into something, we're only kind of grepping in on the areas where there's somebody actually opting out of the built-in protections. And it means in practice, it means once you first turn this sort of stuff on, it means you've got a huge backlog of things to go take a look at in the past, but you've kind of, you're stopping the bleeding and yet going forward, it means the amount of things that you need to review, it drops by orders of magnitude because now you can just look for people opting out of the default and you call it, you call it very, um, when they're opting out of the default, you call it very um, obvious things like unsafely handle user input in all caps. So A, it's real easy to grep for and B, people know what they're doing is not just, oh, I'm gonna turn off this one thing, but put entire system in danger by handling this wrong. When you call that function, you know that you're putting the entire system in danger. Dangerously uh, insecure. Uh, ex yes, exactly. <laughs> 
I will be paying the bug bounty out of my salary. Uh, <laughs> <something>. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, one thing uh, I really like about that approach is it sort of um, flips the concept on its head from doing very sort of like complicated, um, potentially time and resource intensive analysis to something that's much more simple. It's basically like you're not doing uh, crazy interprocedural data flow analysis. You're just like, hey, I know that this is secure. So are you doing the thing I expect you to? Like, are you rolling your own crypto versus using the crypto that we gave you? Um, because you should probably just build, use the nice things we gave you. Um, and uh, don't opt out of it. And that's just computationally much easier to check for. Yeah, uh, yeah it's, it's easier to automate too, right? And, and then you, it, then like that whole process becomes, well, automated, right? And it's much less work for anybody like Tanya was saying, you know, and that it, it kind of just solves itself after a little while with, with a minimal amount of work, upfront work. Yeah, totally. Uh, any final thing you want to chime in, chime in Justine? Just that, I mean, I completely agree. And I think that this uh, focusing on classes of vulnerabilities is a great way to go. And one of the other side benefits is that it lets your security team have some wins. Like <laughs> it can be hard to find wins. And when you can actually say, look, we did it. We killed a class of vulnerabilities. That is a great feeling. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Um, yeah, actually, uh, Justine, one thing I was curious about is, um, so in your red team role, oftentimes you're communicating uh, with manage management and upper leadership. And based on my conversations with a couple of different companies, they one trend, depending on the culture of the company, is that uh, it can be difficult to get leadership buy-in into sort of bigger security efforts. Like, hey, like this is going to pay off uh, hugely long term, but we need like a couple of months to work on it, or maybe longer. So I'm curious if you have any like tips and strategies when you're trying to get buy-in from leadership, or perhaps even just explaining the importance of certain security things. Because um, yeah, like, I... you know, security people can talk with other security people, but uh, that's not our job uh, in isolation. So yeah, I'm curious because uh, you do that a lot in your role. So yeah. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think there are lots of lots of different aspects to it. I think one of the ways that I see offensive security being very very useful is to encourage the behaviors that we're looking for, or to better articulate the risks that we're seeing. And um, just like Tanya was saying, when you go and actually show someone an exploit, or really explain to them what can be done with a given vulnerability, it changes everything. The lights turn on and it's all of a sudden people are excited and, and you know, encouraged to see a reason to fix a lot of the things that you're sending their way and actually want to do that instead of feeling like it's just a hassle, kind of minor thing, it's gonna pop some alert box. You don't understand why that's a problem and um, how it fits into the rest of the ecosystem. I think that's another thing is that we often look at vulnerabilities in a very small scope. We say there's a vulnerability in one application in one system in the company. But if you look at it from the red team perspective, you're often going towards a goal, something that we really care about. And you may use different vulnerabilities in different applications to get to that goal. And it helps you understand why your application that may not do very much is actually still important to secure because it can be a stepping stone to other things that we really care about. So I think it it can really help articulate both to executives and to you know general employees at the company the importance of security. And then I think convincing executives that offensive security is something they should do is a whole different set of <laughs> uh, things you have to think about. And, and a lot there depends on trust and being extremely trustworthy. Um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And along the like the value of different uh, exploit chains, I remember you gave an example once about how there was like a low severity issue in one app and then a low severity issue in another app. And there were like three or four of those. And you're like, but actually I can get to like sensitive user data because of this combination of things that in isolation, uh, you know, we we feel is not that risky. So I thought that was an yeah. interesting lesson. Yeah. Um, yeah, Zane, uh, did I see you about to say something? Oh, th this was the blinking twice for help. I it was three <laughs> questions and then, yeah, sorry. Uh, no, I, I I strongly agree with that, right? I think this is kind of the the interesting thing from offensive security 
side of things, right? Is you you learn how in practice, uh, it's never, it's very rarely just straight from point A to point B in terms of actually compromising real data inside of a real environment. It's often point A to point F to point T to point S to eventually to point B or C. Um, and you're chaining together a million lows and mediums and an occasional high that's on a internal system uh, to eventually get to your actual target there. Um, and I think that that's why the, the two sides really complement each other so well and why the really high functioning security programs are the ones that use the two to constantly reinforce the other, right? As feedback loops for the other of, hey, we think we just wiped out this vulnerability class. Fantastic. Let's have our red team actually try to find some of those in areas where there might've been edge cases. Now let's use that to influence our blue team to say, hey, what alert popped up on our systems, on our monitoring systems, when someone actually found that and discovered it? And you'll find along the way, oh, there are a million edge cases that didn't inherit that new framework. You didn't actually have a bunch of alerts firing when somebody you know, found, when someone actually started exploiting something. And it, it allows you feedback loops to really uh, up-level your security programs over time. Yep. Uh, I actually have a, a very recent, like within the last week or so, uh, real life story about this. We had um, our, we have a offensive team at, at Datadog and, and we had, we asked them to test um, one of our um, endpoint security, you know, uh, it, it's not something that's currently rolled out, but what, something that we were kind of looking at and they identified a number of gaps and we understood like what they were doing, you know, like they kind of like, they wrote down like almost, almost stream of consciousness, like what they were doing and how they were doing it. And we're in the process of kind of writing up all the results here, but even like the preliminary results means we have to go back to the drawing board with our endpoint security solution, right? Like, cause we know that like the gaps that they identified are just not going to be able to be handled by this piece of software. So like, it's just it, like, it generated a lot more work for us, but it's a, it's a great thing, right? Like that's exactly what they what they should be doing, and that's exactly the type of feedback that we need to you know up our game and take it to the next level. It was a really really great story when I when I heard that from my team leads, yeah. I was just I was so excited. I'm like, look, it's working. This is great. <laughs> yeah, I think that's that you both bring to to light something that's super important for any offensive security teams out there is you really need to look at yourself as um, almost like you are a data information team and you're feeding that into all of these other teams at the company. And there's many, uh, but you really need to look at yourself as that. It's not just, uh, you know, you sort of have a vulnerability that you provide, but but there's tons of interesting data that you can gather from um, the attacker's perspective that you can share with the rest of the company. I like it. I'm just like agreeing and nodding and being like all the things. Yes. <laughs> Agreed. Same. Yeah. Did you want to say anything, Tanya? Or? To add slightly to this, once you have these other three brilliant people, you have all of this information about things that are wrong. If you're still having trouble getting management to sign off on fixing these things, I like to sign a send them a risk acceptance document, which is stuff I made up when I first started in InfoSec because no one would do anything. So I said, I can't, I don't have the authority to sign off on this risk. So I need you to sign it. And then I just wrote out basically all the things I just talked about, like the real business things that could happen if we don't fix these things, etc. And then of course, everyone ever refuses to sign that document. <laughs> And I'm like, well, then I guess you would need to give me the authority to fix these things because otherwise you are accepting. And they're like, damn it, Tanya. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I really love that idea. And then because they wouldn't sign it, then they gave you sort of like official approval. And then you could take that from like a very senior manager person to like every other team. And you're like, here's the scroll that says, you know, <laughs> senior yes. director demands fix. Yes, and also if there ever is a major breach and you have in writing, you basically begging for permission to fix these things and upper management refusing, no one's gonna really hang you out to dry on that. I have used things like that uh, when we have had problems. Not gonna say where, <laughs> but it's been helpful to have things in writing repeatedly throughout my information security career. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's sure. laughing because they're like, I know. <laughs> <laughs> we're, all, we're all bad three times for that one. <laughs> <laughs> 
so we've been uh, chatting about a bunch of things um, that people should do. And I was curious about flipping that. Like, what are some things that you think security teams shouldn't do? Uh, either because they're not a, a good use of time or they're counterproductive or, um, yeah. Like, what would you advise people not to do? As high level or as tactical as you want? I um, would say <laughs> making pen testing, security testing, a gate to, to push something live almost never is a good idea. <laughs> Uh, it just puts the security team in a really tough position. Pen testing is not going to be the most efficient way to actually secure your application. It's helpful to kind of, you know, get a, a data point, but it's definitely just one piece of a much larger program. And um, I think using it as sort of a gate um, is not usually the right thing to do. There's probably cases where it is, but, um, but yeah, usually I think it could really burn out a security team and not be the best experience or the most useful um, output for the uh, development teams. Definitely. Uh, Doug, I think you had uh... yeah, Oh, yeah, I, I gave you the high sign there. Yeah, I, don't, I should come up with a new one. That's kind of, I used that twice already. Um, uh, don't mess with the culture. Don't mess with the developer workflows. Uh, don't be creepy. Uh, <laughs> we had this thing where we, we were, we like doing like Slack keywords and, and you know, like, oh, MD5, what are you talking about MD5? What's that gonna, how can I help you? You know, like that sort of thing. Uh, it just ended up being super creepy, don't do that. Um, uh, what else did I say? Yeah, it, like you, you really have to like work with, within your culture of the, com of the company at the time that you're trying to, to do this thing. And you have to work within the, uh, the workflows of your developer. Like, you know, you, you have to use their IDs, use their tools, like, Again, like work with them, like live off the land, like do the same things that they're doing and you will have a much better time than if you're trying to force them to some brand new workflow or like an extra step to do a thing. You know, if you make the secure thing, the easy thing to do or the faster way to do, uh, you know, a thing, um, then, you know, like you're, the acceptance is easy at that point. Uh, or if you could even say like, um, oh, hey, if you expose the secret in source code or you, you know, you accidentally committed the secret, well, you have to roll it now, right? And that's a pain in the butt for you to go to all these systems and roll all these secrets. So, um, you know, uh, get commit hooks. Well, this will like give you a little warning before you commit that and that will prevent you from doing that. So even though that is maybe an extra step and an extra thing that a developer may, may need to install, it saves them the potential for a ton of work and a ton of disruption. And so like you've, you've taken this problem and found a shortcut to prevent it. And it's, even though that's an extra step or it might be like an extra thing um, that needs to happen, it's still a recipe for success. Yeah. Um, I can toss one on here. Of I, I think something that's historically been very challenging for security teams is to be able to really think strategically and recognize that not everything needs to be perfect. And in fact, you're going to lose some battles. And a lot of times, it's going to make a lot of sense to lose a battle to win the wider war of having a effective security program. Um, a story that I know the fellow panelers have heard me tell multiple times because we've we've all gotten to share a bunch of stuff a, a lot of times, but I think is very worthy of this point right here uh, was I was talking with a, a Fortune 500 CISO and I asked them like, hey, how like how are you thinking about cloud? How are you thinking about DevOps? You know, digital transformation, whatever you want to, whatever buzzword you want to call it. Uh, and they stopped me and they're like, oh yeah, we're not doing that here. Like I'm not allowing that. That's not secure. Uh, and I my reaction was, uh, yep, Tanya is pretty much exactly like yours, right? <laughs> uh, which was like, okay, that's a that's a bold career choice. All right. Um, and I got to meet with the, the CIO afterwards and I asked them, I'm like, hey, I'm curious, you know, like every CIO I talk to is all about digital transformation and cloud and DevOps and all these different pieces. And they're like, oh yeah, yeah, it's extremely important here. We have 50 apps in the cloud today. We're going to have 200 by the end of the year and we're going to have several thousand next year. Uh, and I looked at them and they're like, oh, you talked to the CISO. Yeah, we just don't tell them what's going on anymore because they try to say no to everything. Uh, and I think it's the ultimate example. I mean, I'm sure anyone uh, with a security uh, role or title who's watching this right now just winced as badly as we all did when we heard that story. Um, but I think it's the perfect example of this, right? Of security trying to fight tooth and nail to say no to everything until everything is you know perfect and secured. And the rest of the business says, that's, that's great, but we're going to 
go on doing our job. And when you can get your act together, we'll come talk to you again. But until then, we're just going to we're going to go get our jobs done. Uh, and so I, you know, I really think for, you know, what can security do wrong? It's, it's that it's trying to be a gatekeeper on everything rather than enabling folks to move. Mine's going to build off of sayings because <laughs> awesome. I have seen a lot of places where they have created bottlenecks not like maliciously, but for instance, we're going to do the partnership model. We heard Netflix does it and it's super cool. And we're going to pair our OPSEC person with 50 different projects and think that they're going to magically be able to handle that. And so then everything's waiting on this person all the time and their inbox looks like someone aimed a fire hose at it. <laughs> and, and then like everyone's pissed. <laughs> It's like, oh, can you see how that doesn't scale? Like, if you have an AppSec team with 14 people on it, you totally can do that. But a lot of AppSec teams are like the size of this box, like one person, not even as big as the whole box where you see all five of us. And so it's like, yeah, if you have 100 teams, you can't have one AppSec person service all the projects that they're doing. Like, that's not reasonable. So you have to find processes that actually work with what everyone else is doing and make sure you can scale them or you need to calm down, <laughs> figure out a better plan. Because yeah. then they will do what they did with same where they just go around you. We're like, thanks. Thanks for your input. Bye. <laughs> Yeah, I think having the organizational trust that people come to you, um, ideally, they come to you and tell you things that you want to know. Um, Zane has a funny story about that that we might get to at some point. Uh, but at the very least, they don't actively avoid you, uh, I think is good. Uh, one, one thing I quickly wanted to build on what Doug was saying is, uh, like, I totally agree that I think um, making the secure way the easy default is uh, the best way to do it. But I, I almost want uh, this is based on some chats with uh, friends at Netflix uh, and a couple of other companies who said, like, it's great that it's very easy in the default, but if you can even go further than that to make it even, like, easier to do than the normal way, then it's like, well, of course I'm going to do it because, um, like, I get telemetry out of the box for free. Uh, maybe this secure wrapper is, like, more performant. It uh, does, like, automatic um, service discovery securely with other microservices. Like, basically, can you bundle other useful functionality in there for free that developers get um, that they want anyway? Maybe, like, uh, DOS protection or, like, more robustness. Basically, there's, like, maybe 10 attributes that developers care about in addition to security. Um, and if you can like make it just even better than the normal way, let alone the same, um, that's an easy way to get buy-in. Because it's like, oh yeah, this is even better than what I was doing before. Like, of course I'm gonna do that. That's brilliant. Yeah, I'm just borrowing it from other people. Uh, <laughs> that's I okay. Like that idea a lot. It's called knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> I go from first principles only. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, I wanted to um, quickly go to some uh, questions we got from Twitter uh, before this. Um, so David uh, Scribonia asked, uh, what is your favorite pragmatic, that is a uh, bang for your buck, DevSecOps practice or hack? Um, and he referenced uh, something uh, John Melton did where he had like a script to alert on new routes being added to an API uh, as a way to monitor attack surface. But yeah, your, your favorite bang for your buck, um, DevSecOps practice or hack? Saying <laughs> goes, saying goes first. No, no, I'm pointing to you. I'm pointing oh, I was to like, the, the Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Tony. Um, as soon as I figured out you could have more than one pipeline for the same app, I was like, oh, I'm gonna do all the crap. And so, like, you can have one pipeline that releases your code, but then you can have another one on that same app. And then you can just run all the slow stuff that no no one on the dev team or ops team wants to. They're like, Tanya, we do not have time for your crap SAS scan. But it's like, yeah, but I could just, like, kick that off once in a while in the background and not annoy anyone. So once I figured out, like, oh, I can put, like, for instance, secret scanning and, like, some SCA, let's say, in my release pipeline or something else. But then I'm like, oh, I want to do, like, in-depth, like, long, slow stuff because I still want to do that, but I don't want to manually do that. That's boring. I had a job where I had to manually do each. I quit that job. 
Um, <laughs> and so like if I could create a pipeline that will like run, you know, my desk in or in this and that, and like they're dumb, they're not as smart as if you were there running it, but I could just get to come in on Monday and dig through lots of stuff. I'm like, yeah. I like it when I don't have to do the boring stuff. <laughs> totally. I was going to say, like, I, I, I don't know that I'd even call it static analysis and maybe call it like pattern matching, you know, just like some a basic regex and Clint try to restrain yourself, but you know, just a regex, regex based <laughs> code pattern matching, like look for known bad patterns in, in your org. You know, there are some, right? You can find five or six of those and just get those into, um, your, your development pipeline or your coding pipeline, CICD, whatever the proper term is there. Um, I'm just going stream of consciousness now, look at. Um, <laughs> like that's, you can get a lot of bang for your buck in that way. And then also I think just from the people point of view, like I, I don't, I know this question was probably focused more on the technical side of things, but um, the, the, the softer side of things, general awareness, sending out a newsletter, um, uh, giving a presentation, just like anything that raises your overall like visibility within the organization, and then even on the technical side, anything that gives you additional visibility to what's happening, you know, on your networks, in your app, that sort of thing, logging, log all the things, sort it out later, right? So visibility in both, in, you know, in both sections of that are, it can be incredibly helpful. Yeah, I'll, I'll build one small thing off of Doug's there because that's where I was going as well is around the visibility piece. The I think the best bang for your buck that you can do as far as DevSecOps and whatever whatever that means to, to everybody is getting security visibility, not just in front of security people, but in front of the development teams and DevOps teams. Because no matter, no matter how fast your security team is scaling and your security program is scaling, the engineering organization is scaling 10 times faster. And so like, you're never going to keep up. And in fact, you're getting further behind every day. And the only way you actually scale a security program in an org going through DevOps and cloud and all these different changes is by getting security capabilities in front of the, the development teams and the DevOps teams in a way that they can actually consume, not just blinding them with a, here's a 50 page PDF of false positives. That's not, uh, that, that doesn't, that doesn't yeah. count. Like you have to get visibility in front of them that they can actually use. Mm -hmm. And that kind of ties in what with what I think Tanya was saying, you know, one of the first kind of points that we yeah. were making yeah. there, you know, as far as like, it's not just a pop up box that makes it look silly. Like, th these are all the people attacking you right now. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Light bulb moment. Sure. <laughs> yeah, Justine, did you uh, want to add anything? Or? I didn't think um, I saw the eyes, but I just want to give you the opportunity. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, again, I'm not, I can't, I'm not coming up with something technical, but I have I, something Zane brought up before, a small hack, like, for example, um, having a custom logger that you have everyone use, and when they accidentally log a credit card number, um, you replace that with, this is why we can't have nice things, and then they go and they see that in their logs, and they know both that they made the mistake. You've also protected yourself from logging things. <laughs> um, just small things like that. I think someone mentioned something before about just having these visual reminders of like, let's just rename this function across our entire, you know, all of our custom library. Let's rename it to unsafe, 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 never use this. And, you know, like that kind of thing. I think those small things can be helpful. Oh. <laughs> this is why we can't have nice things. That's like yeah, I love that. perfect love thing to write. <laughs> For some reason, uh, there's a lot of people with a credit card number. This is why we can't have nice things. <laughs> yeah. it's a vanity one, I guess. Um, yeah, I just wanted to. <laughs> vanity credit card number? <laughs> yeah, it's like a vanity license plate. You yeah. guys have heard of it, right? No, yeah, I got you. I got you. <laughs> credit card number one. <laughs> Uh, I, I just wanted to tag on a few things. Like I, I totally agree with uh, Doug about looking for like known bad things in terms of, uh, hey, like eval, um, shell exec, like things that are like this turning off TLS cert verification. Like you don't necessarily need to know a lot of context around the code to know that like this is maybe a bad thing. Um, and then to, to shamelessly call out um, something from uh, Zane's Black Hat talk a few years ago um, that I really liked is, 
Uh, not just necessarily. There's one person who liked it. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> there's, yeah. one there's, a, there's one view on YouTube, and I feel very honored. That, uh, <laughs> there are dozens of us. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but but I thought it was very uh, very insightful. Where it's like you don't necessarily have to find like oh this is a vulnerability. Sometimes as a security team, you just want uh, visibility. Where you maybe have uh, like a code base is the responsible for accessing like your most sensitive PII, and you might want to see like oh when are new repos starting to use that library that lets them talk to the sensitive PII because oh this is now like uh, an interesting attack service or uh, this repo didn't used to have crypto but now it does so like this is kind of interesting or like what are all the code uh, repos doing shell exec or um, like we have this specific way to do auth n or auth z. Are there uh, repos where that's happening inconsistently or maybe not at all that we would expect to because it's internet facing or something like that. So like all of these factors are not necessarily a vulnerability, but I think um, like having maybe continuous Slack notifications in the AppSec room about like some of this like security relevant things happening, uh, I think is very interesting. Yeah. So yeah, um, anyone, uh, okay. About to move to the next audience thing. Any? Uh, okay. I was just gonna say I can't imagine the like being on an AppSec team that had a Slack channel because it's always been just me at almost every place <laughs> I've worked. Almost every place I've worked, I'm like, hi, I'm the AppSec team. I mean, so I'm just like, I'm just like, oh my god, I covet that idea. <laughs> <laughs> you could uh, create your own Slack instance for your company and just message yourself and be like, yeah, me. Uh, <laughs> sounds lonely when I said it out loud. Uh, so, so next question, huh? <laughs> so quickly vamping to the next question. Uh, so this question is uh, from Barbara. Uh, she'd be curious to know your views on where to draw the line in responsibility uh, so to where do you split that between development teams uh, and the security team? So there's some trade-off between allowing full autonomy and providing security in a self-service mode versus uh, having a central measuring and maintaining of an adequate security state. Um, so, so it's probably a spectrum, but yeah, curious to hear your all's thoughts. Mm -hmm. Who's who's blinking the most? Who's going first? Yeah, right. <laughs> I'll go. I'll, I'll go because I, uh, I saw this. I saw this question on on Twitter or in Slack or something like that. Uh, I thought it was a really good question. I thought it was interesting. Um, my and again, like when it's kind of like a very broad set of uh, constraints here, right? But and so like I, you know, I hate that. You know, my mind always does. My mind always goes immediately to well, it depends. But it kind of does depend, right? Depends on the type of organization you're in. You know, um, so. Datadog is a very engineering heavy, you know, culture and very, you know, like obviously this is our product and kind of engineers who use the product and 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 um, provide a lot of feedback to each other, right? And so uh, in in that particular uh, environment, it becomes, you know, there's so much code being written, there's so much engineering work being done. As Zane said earlier, like there's no possible way for the security team to catch up, you know, in a more legacy context. And so you have to kind of rely on um, providing tools and awareness and general um, general security knowledge to the rest of the org. So you have to like lean on them a little bit more than you would in maybe a company with a different uh, set of cultural norms. And so it, it's, and, and I think it, it also changes over time as well, right? So, you know, maybe as, as the company is smaller, you need a larger team. And then, you know, the, that, that security team kind of actually maybe branches out, does an embedding sort of thing with, with um, uh, specific development teams and then maybe you have a number of um, advisors sort of thing that are that are providing the tools techniques like uh, act as the you know the final arbiter of, of various security decisions or they do a lot of the architectural design work that sort of thing and you know it uh, you know again in a very mature program program you can have developers that take on take on much more of the responsibility with just you know the, the wise old gray beard there uh, providing advice from on high, you know, it, it, it really all depends, but that's a couple of things that I've thought about. Yeah. I think it's, I can add on a little bit there. Like, I, I think it's, it's a good question and it's a tricky question because at its core, it's really a political question more than a technical one. Right. And I think you've got some organizations that there's one end of the spectrum, like, like Doug mentioned where it's a, a you know, very tech focused, uh, you know, startup sort of company um, 
that, you know, like the engineering teams totally run the show um, and security can kind of advise on that. And then there's other organizations where it's like, you know, it's a financial services that's heavily regulated where security has to sign off on everything, even if they don't want to because of regulatory and compliance needs. I think most organizations find themselves somewhere between those two. And that's why it's really tricky is that the thing I would encourage you to think about there um, if you find yourself between those two kind of goalposts is, you know, you find you optimize for what is going to politically work best inside your organization. In some, it's going to be really embedding with the application teams or DevOps teams or the engineering teams. In others, it's going to be security is a more central service that other ones kind of come to and talk to. But it, it's kind of, you know, in the in the sense of not trying to maintain the illusion of control and then everyone goes around you like I think the the thing for most organizations as they're going through cloud and DevOps and digital transformation is they're changing the way that they create and deliver software and technology. Uh, and security's got to change along with that. And so it, this was fuzzy to begin with. It's getting more fuzzy right now. And I think the challenge for most organizations, not that this really answers your question or solves it, but uh, so much as everyone's dealing with the same challenge. And the ones who are doing it successfully are the ones who are recognizing that security is going to have to change as part of this and finding what what end of that spectrum works best inside your organization is the ones that actually like really find success and that kind of new home for security. Yeah, I'd also say that, yeah, I completely agree. It's a real tricky question and the lines are just getting more and more blurry, which maybe that's what's supposed to happen, you know? We're supposed to kind of blend together. Um, but I do think there are certain functions that benefit from being a centralized function. Mm -hmm. One of them being uh, defense. So the people that are, managing the alerts coming in from all the systems that are figuring out how to write new alerts that are figuring out how to tune detection systems that are figuring out how to handle huge log pipelines like these aren't things you want your entire engineering team to have to figure refigure out over and over again especially when it's not in their area of expertise um, so i think that that there are some functions that are really better suited to being more centralized um, but when it comes to especially application security, I think that blend is kind of where it should be, you know, um, kind of where we don't. I also always try to think of security as trusted advisors. So we will tell you, we will give you all the information that we can to help you make the right decision. Because it's your product and your thing that you're pushing out there. So that may be one line one kind of fuzzy line that you could look at. Yeah. I find often, um, so I do a lot of consulting, quite often people will call me in and they wanna create a policy so they can like walk around and whack people on the head with it. Um, and I've explained how that will get them not invited to parties. <laughs> um, <laughs> and they'll be unpopular. Uh, and people will go around them as discussed and it would be a lot smarter like when I've created policies or standards or whatever. I do this weird thing where I ask the developers what they think um, and then like invite them to comment, have meetings, hang out, bring like donuts or whatever is the stuff that people eat at that place because some people are like, no, we're gluten free. I, I'm gluten free, but anyway, so I like figure out what their jam is and then try to like lure them in. I'm like, did you know I have pizza? Um, and then, and then like ask them like, so like we want to set up this as like a standard, but I know you can't meet it now or some of you can, but like, how can I make this you know six month plan so that you can meet it? Or like, do you feel this is reasonable or like, oh, number 17, like, that's not applicable because of blah, okay. Or like, could we adjust this? Or do you know what I mean? And then like talk with them about it. And then when it comes out, most of the people who are the type of person that would speak up has had their opportunity to speak up. Mm -hmm. And I've like adjusted things and like tried to compromise. And then it's like, okay, so now we have like this plan and it's a guideline right now, but in six months, it's gonna be a standard for all new apps. And within one year, all the old apps need to be compliant. And we are gonna make a plan and I'm gonna check in really friendly like with donuts to ask, how is it going? It's been a month, what's up? How are you doing? 
and like go like that, if that makes sense. And I find a lot of places they're like, we want this so that we can walk around and whack people with it. And I'm like, I don't know if you know how to make friends very well, but I have to persuade them. I view myself as an influencer of security. I like influence the devs. I try to show them and 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 say like I'll come help you be compliant. Like let me can I give you a lunch and learn on this or whatever the thing is to get us there. And I have got much better results with Honey. And then once most of the people are on and we're accepting it, if there's like one or two teams that are just not on board, that's where I'm like, okay, you're going to meet me and Tanya because she has made a risk acceptance sheet for someone and they refuse to sign it. And now I am coming with you, like coming over to your team. And I'm going to be like, mm -hmm. <laughs> now do you want my help? <laughs> But usually I find people get on board, especially if you go and you ask them like, so you went in the in the bug tracker and you marked all the things I put in as fixed, but they're like not fixed and you like definitely didn't fix them or do anything. I did like you just, I see you marked them all in a one minute period. You looked <laughs> me up and marked them all as fixed. So like, can we talk about this? <laughs> Should we have beer to talk about this? Is that necessary? Like, do you need a hug? <laughs> That's awfully yeah. specific, Tanya. You're speaking from <laughs> experience. <laughs> like person, yeah. Right, so I'm like, <sighs> <laughs> hypothetically, if this were to have happened. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Okay, not venting. <laughs> yeah, agreed. It's okay. It's okay. Grab that whiskey. It's all right. It's all right. Uh, yeah, I, I really like that um, example of like just getting buy-in from the beginning. I think. Um, Riot Games, as well as uh, Seek, uh, the engineering teams have um, this like RFC process where when they're trying to use a new technology or framework or just building out a big um, system and how things are going to work, they write this very detailed RFC that's like, this is how it's going to work, this is why, this is sort of like deep dive into all the different design trade-offs. Mm -hmm. And the security teams there have uh, adopted a similar approach where they're like, hey, we think that we should do this because of security benefits, blah, 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 and basically having the engineers comment on it and iterate to a agreed upon solution together. Um, and then when it's time to roll it out, it's like, hey, we already agreed. This isn't a surprise. We didn't come up with this in isolation. And there's probably a lot of things that as a security team, we may not uh, be aware of. Like, oh, we thought this would be a good approach, but uh, it's going to be a killer for latency or something, which is unacceptable for this specific service or something. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I, I really like that approach. Um, it's, I stole it. Um, so we had a, a minister once who had to make the budget for Canada for the year. And he just slowly released pieces of information and like publicized them bit at a time and like asked for comment. And so by the time the budget came out, everyone was already on board and everyone was like, why do we do that every year for the whole time of Canada's existence? Like, cause usually what they would do is they would like, be like it's this and everyone would be like, no. And he's like, uh, is this cool, everyone? Like, <laughs> and by the time you released it, everyone's like, yeah, yeah, we know. We did, we do that with the election results as well. When we count all the ballots, we have all the members of the media and all the different parties in the room. So then when Elections Canada announces it, everyone already knows it's already all over the news. And they're like, yeah, yeah, we know, we know. And by doing that, by like, kind of like, leaking your own information but like officially and on purpose like you end up with if people are upset they'll like come to you sooner and you can kind of try to fix it i used to do that with pen test results too i would tell all the devs first yeah. be like i saw this thing can we talk <laughs> yeah anyway <laughs> canadians <laughs> I think there's a lot we could learn probably uh so uh, we're uh, getting close to time. So I was curious um, if there's uh, sort of like one major thing that you think would be most useful to leave people with, um, like a, a primary takeaway, witticism, turn of phrase, haiku, uh, whatever you wish uh, that you would like to leave people with. Uh, now's the time. Doug, you had this, you, had, you went back. No, I'm not too, uh, you know, uh, spur of the moment, I'm not too good at security haikus, but not, I'm going to come back with one for the next panel. You have that one sonnet you always like saying, Doug? Uh, yeah, yeah, but there's not nearly enough time for me to, to get through all of it. It's far too dense. Um, I would say, uh, you know, like just 
kind of, I guess, I guess on the advice and suggestion side of things, um, you know, uh, feel free to attack a problem from a different angle, you know, um, very basic example is like, you know, rather than attempt to, uh, again, this is just a, a, a bad example from a former life, but rather than try to like secure GitHub access within your organization, Make it look. <laughs> We're all having more. What? What? What do you do? It's the secret. We'll never find out. We'll never know. <laughs> okay. While we're waiting, uh, let's see. Tanya, do you want to go next or? Yeah. I, I would say that if you are going to do application security in a DevOps environment, go talk to Dev and Ops, learn their processes, and then figure out how you fit in as opposed to trying to, so whenever you bulldoze things, like I've never had that work. I've never had that work well. So instead going over and talking, introducing yourself and then just being like, so what, tell me your processes so I can see where I fit. Yeah. Did everybody get no. the, 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 the whole part of my sonnet? You were <laughs> it, it, and it, it cut out. I took. We're I told dying you it was a to dense. know. Yeah. It's too dense. No, 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 no. I can't restart it now. Uh, I think the last thing I heard was uh, rather than trying to secure access to GitHub, poignant pause. <laughs> oh man, I'm getting. <laughs> well, and that's what I'm going to leave you with. If you choose your own adventure, security. This is how I do things, actually. <laughs> When uh, you try to make it less that. valuable. Yeah. You try to make it less valuable. You try to approach a problem from a different angle, right? Uh, and the other thing I was going to say was uh, to gain visibility first and then automate as much as possible. So provide that increased visibility, like I said, from from a people side of point of view as well as a technical side of view as a side of things. And then, um, you know, just do your thing, automate and and move forward as fast as you can, trying to keep up. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I would say, I guess, you know, there's always going to be bugs. There's always going to be bad things that happen. I think what's really important is how you respond. And so think about response. Think about your response plans when you're building things and think about what you're going to do if the bad thing happens. And uh, I think that makes everybody's life a lot easier. So I'll leave you with. Clint, you said haiku. Let's see. I've got cherry blossoms fall, uh, be enabler, not blocker. Um, and I, I kind of get a third line out of the haiku there. But uh, no, I think like exactly as everyone as everyone said, uh, you know, it security historically has always fallen back to saying no, because it kind of worked both technically and politically with how we used to architect security teams. And I think recognize that uh, that saying no in a in the kind of environment that we all live in now of cloud and DevOps and moving much quicker, it's going to cause much more harm to the end state of security that you want than you might actually think. And so recognizing, uh, you know, exactly as everyone said, you know, how can how can we get visibility? How can we bring that to the application teams, the DevOps teams? How can we find ways to say yes? How can we really like work with these teams and, and make the default safe to use and everything there? It's a fundamental rethinking of how we done, we've done security teams for 20 years, 30 years. Like it's not easy. That's why we're all uh, talking on panels and sharing with our peers and everything like that. And I think that's that's probably the final piece of advice I'd give is reach out to your peers. I don't know a security uh, practitioner on the planet who isn't interested in chatting with their peers, even if it was a cold message on LinkedIn of just, hey, I'm curious, how, have you had this problem? I'm curious how you're approaching this problem. Um, I think we all really are interested in sharing lessons learned with each other. So please, I would say reach out to any of us, reach out to your peers, all, all of that. Happy to help. I made a hashtag for this called Ask InfoSec on Twitter. Awesome. So I just, when people ask nice. a random question, I tweet it and then people answer. So please feel free to just like use that for anything. And then people just magically come and find you and, and they give you answers. It's awesome. <laughs> Who knew you could just like put a, a hash symbol in front of things and then magic occurs. <laughs>
I'm going to start hash, uh, hashtagging things with security influencer. <laughs> I'm telling you, I think that's that's like th that that means thought leader in 2020. Well, I think has been going so well so far. <laughs> Right, like Tanya Jenga security yeah. influencer. Hashtag yeah. info like murder hornets. Yeah, it'll be yeah. <laughs> 2020, uh, 2020 hashtag. Oh my gosh. My, I, in retrospect, I should have thought of a haiku while I was listening to all you, but I did not. Uh, I made a terrible mistake. Uh, but yeah, I, I think to echo what a lot of people have said, I think building relationships with uh, development teams and the rest of the organization, uh, the value of that cannot be overstated. Um, it, it, I think it's the difference between people ignoring you and being like, ah, oh, this is a bit of friction, but I'm willing to work with you to make it better. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's a huge deal. And also when you are choosing projects and things to work on, have a, a mind for the bigger picture. Like, will this make me like systematically scalably better in the future? Or is it just like fighting an immediate fire and not making me long-term more effective uh, as a team? So I think that's a useful way to think about it as well. Um, but yeah, nice. thank you all so much for your time. Uh, I had a blast. And uh, thank you so much, DevSecCon, for having us and throwing this wonderful event. And uh, we'll see you on the interweb soon. Hey, Simon.